The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website. Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake, and we have something very special for you today. Dr. Andrew Jewell from the University of Nebraska, who is the scholar on Willa Cather. And we're going to talk about all the wonderful books that Willa Cather wrote. Please stay tuned. The power of music, the power to heal, to comfort, to bring joy. That is what my segment is about today. I'm Kristen Stowes, and my guest, Patty Neiman, has put this belief into practice. Please stay tuned to listen to and to hear about the Eastridge Hospice Singers. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Jerry Renault. One of the things that concerns all of us as we get a little older is being alone. There is some research being done into artificial intelligence voice assistance that can help in that endeavor. Our guest today is Valerie Jones. She's a professor at the College of Journalism and Mass Communications at the University of Nebraska. She will be here to talk about that research. Don't go away. How much is that favorite bowl of yours worth, or is it really an antique? I'm Doug Jones. Stay tuned for an interesting and informative discussion about antiques, especially things that you might think about at Christmas time. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake, and we have a special guest and a special program for you today because it's going to be on Willa Cather. I just got my Nebraska Life magazine in the mail, and I opened it up, and there is a whole section on the legends at the University of Nebraska and who tops the legend but Willa Cather. I was so excited, I said, oh gosh, this is wonderful. She is the top legend that we have. And we have another legend with us today, <laughs> Andy Jewell, because he's in charge. Give us your official title and what you do with the Willa Cather. I am a professor in the University Libraries and I'm also the editor of the Willa Cather Archive, which is a digital project, and I'm one of the editors of Cather's Letters. I've done a book and now a big digital project on her letters. Well, now, how did you get first interested in Willa Cather? It's been quite a while ago when I was in um, getting my master's degree. I first was assigned Willa Cather in a class and I frankly had grown up in North Platte, Nebraska, didn't think I'd be interested in what I thought Willa Cather was, but finally when I was uh, rightfully uh, encouraged by a professor to read her work, I was blown away by uh -huh. the quality of it. Uh -huh. And I kept reading, kept reading, and decided to come here to this university in Lincoln and work on a PhD uh, and study Willa Cather professionally. Do you remember the first books that you read? The, the, I, the first story I read was called Neighbor Rossicky, and then oh. I think the first novel was O Pioneers. Yeah. Oh. yeah. oh, that was one of the special, one of the favorite ones. <laughs> okay. Now, if our viewers have not gone to Red Cloud to see the Willa Cather Museum and the house, you're missing something very special in Nebraska. It really would be important to go now. Uh, how far is the drive from Lincoln to Red Cloud? It's a, it's a very nice, easy drive, about two and a half hours, and it's a wonderful place to visit. Um, there, it's a, a remodeled area. Uh, uh, there's some d historic homes and buildings and churches and banks that you can visit, including the Willa Cather Childhood Home, there which is... A, there's her house right now. Yeah, and it is uh, recently got... Um, it, it needs some preservation work, and recently we got a $415,000 grant from the federal government, a Saving America's Treasures grant. I just got will, this news from Cather Country, yeah. and they're going to give, uh, give us $415,000 to renovate and take yeah, care and make I, it I just that's so exciting right and need, these things of course need to be taken care of and it's such a um, it's right and it's a good honor for, to have the nations recognize Cather's child at home as one of the treasures of the United States and there is a museum there um, where they have a wonderful exhibit in the National Willa Cather Center and you can go and learn about Cather watch a film to get introduced to her you could shop in the Cather store you could see the art gallery there's all it's a wonderful um, community and a place to visit to learn more about Cather. What was Willa like as a young girl growing up in Red Cloud Nebraska? Well she, her whole life she was a very independent person and you can see in this photograph of her when she was a teenager that she threw off some of the 
inventions of the day and cut her hair short, um, wore her own style, uh, was proud to be different than other people. She wanted to be a doctor when she was young and she would follow some of the local doctors around on the rounds and there's even a story that she once gave chloroform to a patient who was getting an amputation. Uh, and, uh, now, that might be a legend, but that is one of the stories. <laughs> Now, Willow went to the University of Nebraska in right. 1890. In 1890, she went and she had a year in what was a, called a Latin school or the prep school to get ready. And then in, in 1891, she became a freshman at the university and graduated in 1895. And that big yes, that rock yeah. is still there. It's still there. That's where right. Is, the rock where she is standing here on campus, that rock. Um, is now in front of Morrill Hall. And you can go, and I confess, I once, as a total dork, got my picture taken just like that on that rock. <laughs> <laughs> well, since she attended the University of Nebraska, which is so thrilling, but then she started to write for the Lincoln Journal Star. Yes, that's and right. Did that start her creative writing, yes. really? Yes, yeah, she really became, she started to become a writer when she was in college. And first, one of her essays she wrote for a class was put into the newspaper and published in the paper by her professor who Whoa. was so impressed with it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> and, and then after that, and within the next couple of years, she got a job working for, it was then called the Nebraska State Journal. And she wrote many, many um, columns, reviews. She'd review concerts and theater through town, both big national traveling shows and also local productions. She was very funny, very cutting, um, uh, always spoke her mind and with a confidence that was uh, larger than her years. <laughs> well, there were all those opera places around because yes. we didn't have the we didn't have movie theaters at that Right, time. there are no movie theaters, of course, but there were very large, um, uh, they call them opera houses. They didn't just have opera, they also had musical theater and comedy and concerts and, you know, all sorts of things. So then she could write a review on that That's stuff. right, she did, <laughs> yeah. Okay, did, did Willa write by hand or was the typewriter invented You know, it changed time? a little bit through her life, but um, mostly what we believe she did was write most of all of her work, whether it be columns or uh, novels. You know, later as she matured and wrote My Antonia, O Pioneers, all these wonderful books, she would write them first by hand. And then she did know ah. how to type. Yeah, she wrote them. And well, the typewriter had been invented. Yeah, she time. had one early enough, and sometimes she said she'd even write them multiple times by hand as she drafted through, and then she would go through and type them up, revising a little bit as she went, um, fixing it, and then she would read through what she had typed, change it again, type it again, and go through oh. many different um, passes before it would become the published novel. Okay, now what do we see when we go to Red Cloud? Um, well, there's uh, many things that you could see there. Uh, it's the largest collection of historical properties and dedicated the to an author. Museum. Yes, that is downtown Red Cloud, which is a wonderful place to visit. Several of those bays are the National Willa Cather Center, where they have the museum exhibit, um, the the bookstore, the gallery, and they can you can start tours there to go and visit several of the historic properties all around town. And you can you can see the, the train depot, depot, the Garber Bank. Um, etc. Now what was Willa writing back in, uh, in 1917? Okay, yes, 1917 was an important um, moment because she was working on a book that became arguably her most famous novel ever, which was My Antonia. Yeah. She had published by this point, O Pioneers, another one called Song of the Lark, and she was trying to figure out what to do next, and she visited Red Cloud. She, so she, this, at this point in her life, her permanent home was in New York, and, but she came back to Nebraska all the time. And in 1916, 1917, she visited Red Cloud. She saw some of her old friends, including Anna Pavelka, um, oh, who, yes. Yes, who was a woman she, she knew when she was young and who inspired a character who became did, uh, my Antonia. Did she, didn't she live next door or something? She worked for the family that lived nearby for a time, and that is probably where Cather got to know her. Um, but she uh, also um, was just a part of the community. Um, Cather knew her when she was a little bit older than Cather, just a couple years. When Cather was a teenager in Red Cloud, she knew Anna Pavelka, saw her again, met her large family, um, and was inspired to write My Antonia. And when you read that book, it is inspired in part by this trip back to Nebraska in 1916. Um, and then in 1917, um, th she was writing the book too. Well, we owe remembrance to the people who first captured Willa Cather and yes. brought her to, which were u university professors, yeah. uh, Mildred Bennett yes. from Red Cloud, who yes. lived there. She was the one who really started to get 
Yes, right. Attention. Mildred Mildred mm -hmm. Bennett is is the uh, founder, yeah. really, and the driving force behind the Willa Cather Foundation and what is now the National Willa Cather Center. And her work was amazing for preserving things that were being threatened to, to um, pass away and to um, promote Cather's legacy. She wrote books and, and worked tirelessly to the end of her life um, advocating for Cather. And of course, you knew Bernice Sloat. Well, I took Bernice Sloat's class yeah. back in the 1960s. I had never heard. I was from Minnesota yeah. and I never heard of, of Willa Cather and started. And I, I mean, and she was a wonderful teacher and I got yeah. so involved with Willa Cather. And I just, I brought these books. So these were just some of the books, yeah. you know, that, uh, that I had read and, and kept. I've got to give them to the public <laughs> library because oh, good. I'm sure I probably won't it, go yeah. back. But <laughs> well, Bernice Lowe was uh, a wonderful teacher, a wonderful scholar. Her work that she did 40, 50 years ago is still um, hi highly valued and used. And someone that she helped mentor was my mentor. That is uh, Sue, uh, Sue Rosowski, oh, yes. who knew Bernice and worked with her. Um, um, Susan Rosowski uh, was very important to me to introducing Willa Cather, to helping me learn how to grow into doing Cather scholarship. Um, and I think about Sue all the time. Well, w one of the people that I love most of all is uh, the person who well, when Willa Cather actually got the, the, big, the big award, uh, the Pulitzer Prize. Oh, yes. But she got it for the book called One of Ours. That's right. That wasn't my favorite book. I I, mean, yeah, you're not the only one, although I like uh, it. You should, you should uh, read it again, because I think it, it, is, it, it, is a, it is an interesting book. The first part of it is um, set in Nebraska, and it um, is a look at what it was like to, for this, this character, Claude Wheeler, to experience a, a difficult um, teenage years and also to uh, the home front during World War I. And then the book follows him as he joins the American Expeditionary Force and goes to World War I. And it was inspired by Cather's cousin, G.P. Cather, who had a similar story. Um, and it did win the Pulitzer Prize. And uh, I think now, as we've just passed the 100 year anniversary of, of one, World War I, we begin to kind of look at it with fresh eyes and realize how valuable a book it is. Well, it's a very special place, and if you've never been down to Red Cloud and seen her beautiful little home, in fact, I, I got to tell you one little thing yes. because uh, from Bernice Sloat, she took the class down to Red Cloud. Yeah. I had never been there, and up in it, it's it's a like a one and a half story house. She had a little tiny a little tiny bedroom, right? And there was a window there, and she could look out, you know, and see. Yes. So I went into that bedroom. And I, I looked out the window thinking about, well, there, is the window right there? Is that, that's uh, the It's not the, the same window, the but side. it's the one off the little L or whatever. Yeah. yeah, okay, so I looked out there, and then there was her bed, her little single bed, so I lay down in her bed, you know, just to see what it would have been like. <laughs> well, you know, so I lay down, and I didn't think anything about it, you know, made yeah. sure I didn't have dirty boots on, you know, <laughs> so, but I just thought, oh, this is what it would have been like for, well, okay. Then the la I went to Red Cloud a couple of years ago for one of your big right. productions, and so I thought I'd go in and look at the bedroom and so forth. We don't get in the bedroom anymore. There's a great big <laughs> glass wall there, yes. and I thought, oh, all oh, more people. You, you like had a special I, experience. If you go there now, you cannot lay down in Kather's bed. No. <laughs> <laughs> but but you can still see that room, and you and you can see the wallpaper that she put her put on the walls herself. Um, that was she was very proud of. She <laughs> called it the Rose Bower because it had rose wallpaper on it, and, and it was she was to say something about her personality. She was the only child who had her own room, oh. and she was the oldest, but she also declared that she needed her own space. Oh. I think. <laughs> well, Andy, I'm so glad that you got involved with Willa Cather because you're very to. special, and and of course she she passed away a long time ago, yeah. and we had, do have a picture of her gravestone. And maybe you could read what the captions yes, are on, on the gravestone. On the gravestone there is, um, and this is a photo I took when I had the pleasure to visit it. It's in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. Um, and it has a quote at the bottom that is one of the most well-known quotes from Cather's book, My Antonia. It's, that is happiness, to be dissolved into something complete and great. And I think what a wonderful, um, what a wonderful words to have on the gravestone. Um, in a place that she loved to be, um, and a way to remember all that she contributed to our world. And now you continue the contribution to Willa Cather. Thank you. Dr. Andy Jewell, very, very special. How delighted and, and, and pleased to have well, you here. Thank you for having me, Lita. <laughs> and don't forget, it's never too late to live and learn more about our Willa Cather. 
Legal services are a part of the spectrum of senior services available through our eight area agencies on aging. Attorneys can assist and educate seniors on consumer credit and debt collection issues, as well as help them plan ahead with advanced directives. Attorneys can also help seniors with consumer fraud and financial exploitation concerns, and also guide them through government benefit issues. For more information, contact the Elder Access Line at 800-527-7249. Before introducing my guest, let's listen to a small group of the Eastridge Hospice Singers. Joys are flowing like a river Since the Comforter has come He abides with us forever Makes the trusting heart his home Blessed quietness Holy quietness, what assurance in my soul. On the stormy sea, speaking peace to me, how the billows cease to roll. Like the falling rain from heaven, like the sunlight from the sky, so the Holy Ghost is given, falling on us from on high. Blessed quietness, holy quietness, what assurance in my soul. On the stormy sea, seeking peace to me, how the billows cease to I'm Kristen Stowes, and I welcome Patty Neiman, founder and coordinator of the Eastridge Hospice Singers. Patty, welcome to Live and Learn. Thank you for having me today. Absolutely, I'm so thrilled that you are here. I understand you have a group of 18 singers in total. I'd like to begin by having you introduce the four singers who joined you in the opening song. Um, t with me today were Ann Moore, Stan Guerin, um, Bill Rears, and Deb Reichert. Okay, and they come from all walks of life, correct? All walks of life. But they have this common desire to sing. That is exactly right. With a yes. beautiful purpose, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> well, we think so. Yes, absolutely. So, Patty, while this music group is new to Lincoln, I know, but it's not a new idea. Could you please tell us how your desire to start this venture began? Last summer, um, actually, in the spring, my husband Roger was reading the paper and he alerted me to an article in the Lincoln Journal, Journal Star okay. about a hospice singing group that had started in Hastings. And it was started by a very good friend of mine and fellow music educator, um, Tom Mahalik. So um, I became very intrigued and at the same time um, spiritually felt a tug that maybe that was what I was called to do in my retirement. So I visited with Tom, and he told me that we actually had another person, Peter Amadon, from um, Brattleboro, uh, Vermont, who had started one of these hospice singings group, singing groups called the Hallowell Singers, and um, they have been singing for 16 years. Really? And so I began to think about that mm -hmm. and, and see if it maybe would be a possibility. and and uh, he was very encouraging and I contacted Peter and several other um, people um, and that's how I found out about it. So once you decided that you really did want to start this in Lincoln, you had groundwork to do. Yes, did you did. start by reaching out to the community, community organizations for input? How did this happen? Well, not sure um, exactly how to start. Um, I started with our pastor at Eastridge okay. Presbyterian Church, mm -hmm. um, Melody Jones, Jones, Pot Melody Jones Poynton, okay. and she was very supportive of the idea. And having, our church has had a long um, growing um, relationship with Tabitha. So we reached out to Tabitha, to the hospice volunteer coordinator mm -hmm. at Tabitha, mm -hmm. and she also felt like it was a great, um, something great that would be good for their hospice clients um, sure. to, to experience and have an option yeah. mm -hmm. um, when they were in, um, in hospice care. Sure. So after that, then I have many music contacts, but I um, asked a few very trusted friends mm -hmm. 
to come over to my house and we talked Aww. about it. And they, of course, thought that it was wonderful. Yes. And um, so from there, then I sent out just to a select group of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, we met for an informational meeting. There were 25 okay. mm -hmm. that um, at that informational meeting and 16 then um, and decided sure to join me. So um, we had training in October. And off you and are. Off we went. <laughs> off we went. Well, I would think that this could be kind of an emotional undertaking for you as well as the singers. What do you do to handle that component? Well, those that know me well know I wear my emotions on my sleeve. Okay. And having my mother and my mother-in-law in hospice, mm -hmm. um, I knew how emotional that could be. Mm -hmm. But again, feeling like this was what I was supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. um, I decided that by reading and reading the book um, on the breath of song, oh. um, singing at the bedside of the dying. That was a, an instrumental book for me to read. It's by Kathy Leo, who also is a founding member of the Hallowell Singers. Okay. And in there, she chronicles their 16 year journey mm. of being hospice um, singers. And she gives some guidance okay. um, mm -hmm. as to deep so breathing techniques to and helpful. watching your music and um, even saying that tears are okay. Mm -hmm. But we, oh, bought, sure. we give our, our singers grace to leave a situation mm -hmm. if it becomes too emotional yeah. for them. Well, it's so heartfelt, it's, so yeah. that would be understanding to everyone. So how long has this group been actively singing then? Um, we started in December. We had okay. training in October, practiced our music in November, and then in December on a snowy Sunday afternoon, oh. on the first Sunday of December, three of us went to um, Journey House, which is Tabitha's okay. hospice house, and sang for a woman who was very close to the end of her earthly journey. And so that's when it began. Okay. And so. How has this been received by clients and their families then? Well, we feel very well. Um, the word has been slowly and purposefully gotten out about our ministry and mission. Okay. Um, not knowing how it was going to work and whether it was going to work sure. and whether I would have singers. Um, but now the word is starting to spread and we okay. are um, officially um, connected with Tabitha Hospice and Horizon oh, Hospice. Right. So their social workers get us in touch with families. Uh -huh. But we will sing for anybody in any hospice um, situation. And where do you actually sing? Does it have to be a large space or can it be a room? Um, some of our singing is actually in a large space because okay. the hospice client has asked us to sing for if they're in a residential facility, oh. they would like their friends to yes. hear us. So that takes on more of a, like a sing-along. Sometimes we are in a bedroom where we're with a patient who is um, pretty coherent and we mm -hmm. can communicate with and mm -hmm. sing and talk and everything. And then there's a third um, situation where we call it a vigil, where a person okay. is very close to, I they're see. actively dying and they're very close to their earthly journey. So they all take sure. on just a little bit of a different mm -hmm. um, yeah. aspect. Yes, make it very personalized, mm -hmm. yes. individual, yes. Yeah. How do you choose the music to sing? Um, to begin with, I used ideas from Tom and from Peter, knowing okay. what they, their groups were singing. And then over our time together, we've um, taken out some songs and put in others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when we go to sing for people, we actually, I tailor the, the sing with any of their suggestions, their favorite hymns or uh -huh. songs, if we can, yes, um, at least two or three. And then we have okay. a, a variety of both sacred and secular songs that, okay. that we fill in, um, mm -hmm. that some of them are our favorites to, sure, to do. Sure. That we so like it is to meaningful do. for the yes. family and right. for the client. Right. Yes. yes, yes. How about how long would your visit last? Um, some of them are pretty short, 15 okay. minutes, but we have, mm -hmm. especially the sing-alongs, will go 45. Oh, um, yes. And okay. um, so, it, it, and a lot of times we're not sure once we, especially if it's a vigil mm -hmm. or if it's uh, going into a person who, even if they are um, able to communicate with us, sometimes it's tiring to have extra people yes, in the room. I can imagine. And so we have mm -hmm. to be very flexible when we okay. go in for what we're going to find. Well, tell me about your singers. How are they chosen? Um, our singers aren't actually chosen, okay. but I believe they are led to our mission oh, and ministry. That's beautiful. Um, because not everybody, it's kind of like the Nebraska slogan, mm -hmm. Nebraska isn't for everybody. <laughs> Hospice singing is not for, is not for everybody. Yes, but yes. Um, the people that have been led to our group um, have great compassionate hearts mm -hmm. 
and have a feeling of that music is so powerful and can at the end of life can be something so oh, so wonderful. Absolutely. So. Is there training required then once they are chosen? Um, singing wise, no. Um, we okay. but because we sing a cappella, we don't have mm -hmm. any accompanying instruments. Ah, I see. Sure. It's important that our singers are able to match pitch and to follow a vocal line and to hold a vocal line. Sometimes we only have three or four singers that are singing, and if sure. we're singing in parts, then we need them to be able to follow and hold hold their part. Okay. So we don't have auditions, but we do. We will have an informational meeting on the first um, October first, mm -hmm. Wednesday, Tuesday, I believe Tuesday it is, at okay. six thirty at Eastridge Presbyterian Church. If anybody's interested sure. in sure. in coming and learning more, and then there is a six to eight hour hospice training oh, session yes. that is that would be required. Very important, that I'm is sure. very required and you yes. can't be a part of our group without yes. that. No. So no. and I'm sure that everybody would appreciate that. <laughs> Are you always looking then for additional singers? Um, would you I like don't to expand we, your group? We would, except that only if that if people would like to be a yes. part. And so okay. I think again, they are led to find out more about us. Um, okay. Our last information meeting, we have five had five people, oh, and one okay. of them said, "This isn't for me." Sure. And four of them joined mm -hmm. our group then, and yes. so they are yeah. our newest new okay. singers as of May. It's wonderful, Patty. I know there are viewers out there that would like to get in touch with you either for a visit possibly or because they're a singer that would like to join. We will be putting up your contact information on okay. screen for that purpose. And while that is being shown, we would like to hear from you your thoughts on the power of music. And we have probably about 30, 40 seconds left. Okay. Well, what we do, I feel, is bring a musical hug or wrap our clients with music. So more like a cocoon. So we okay. hope that we bring peace and comfort and many times there's a lot of joy in the room as we sing and as people enter this part of their, their earthly lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is so beautifully said. That's Thanks. perfect ending, Patty. Thank you so much for taking on this unique challenge and helping so many in such a caring, compassionate way. You're very welcome, Chris. Very Thank much appreciated. Absolutely. And as I remind all of you, it's never too late to live and learn. We will listen to one more selection from the Eastridge Hospice Singers. Enjoy. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. A band of angels coming after me. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low. Carry me home. Hi, I'm Randy Jones with Aging Partners. Did you know that Lincoln expects a 75% increase in the number of seniors living in our community over the next 15 years? Aging Partners is a community service that provides fitness programs to help keep older adults strong and healthy. This year, Lincoln Cares donations are providing funds for new fitness equipment. You can help make this happen. Sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. Today, I think we have a fascinating subject for you and we have a fascinating guest who's going to, um, to be with us as well. It may be something that you want to consider for yourself or maybe a friend and we're going to show you a little bit about it uh, a little bit later on in the show, but it is artificial intelligence voice assistance and can it help make your life or the lives of someone you know a little bit easier. And here to uh, talk to us about it is um, Valerie Jones. Valerie is a professor at the University of Nebraska at the College of Journalism and Mass Communications, and she is doing some research into this very subject. Valerie, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being here. 
You have had an interesting career. I have shortened it because it goes on for <laughs> about as long as your arm. Um, you were a media strategist in San Francisco. You developed a specialization in digital and online media strategy, and you had some experience in video gaming. You decided to come back, in Nebraska, uh, come back to Nebraska in about 2006. You've worked for some major advertising and public relations companies. And then you decided to take your expertise into academia. What made you make that decision? Temporary insanity, obviously, <laughs> okay. right? Um, no, in a word, I think it was purpose. So I loved what I was doing. Um, it's fun to craft online advertising strategies for companies for sometimes the first time they'd ever advertised online. I've been doing that for a while. Um, uh, but at some point you're looking for some meaning in your work and I wasn't necessarily getting that from what I was doing. Um, I come from a long family of teachers mm -hmm. and I always wanted to be at, uh, at play school growing up and things. Um, so this was really about purpose and meaning. So uh, helping people learn some of the things that I learned, helping to share my expertise, um, being a part of the university, um, which I think is such an important part of the state as a native, having grown up here, it was such a big deal. Um, and then just the research component too. So transitioning you know, what I'd learned in the professional space into thinking deeply about how we communicate and how communication influences people and communicating in more than a PowerPoint, which is pretty much all I communicated in in the, in the advertising space. Right. But it's been, it's been a lot of fun. I'm really glad I did it. Very cool. You're in a great spot. Okay, that's a great transition too because let's talk about uh, the research because one of the things that uh, the university does is um, look at different areas and different topics in different ways and in lots of times it's how do we make our lives a little bit better and a little bit easier. So let's talk about your research. You have received uh, what's called a layman grant uh, to look into this subject of how do we use artificial intelligence um, uh, voice support um, to try to make our lives a little bit easier. How did this all come about? Yeah. Um, well, the layman grants are a really great kind of opportunity through the university. Um, it's a competitive grant and they award them to people that they think um, have some good ideas and um, it helps set them up for larger grants. Um, at the completion of them. So fortunately, um, I won one. I'm working with um, Dr. Michael Hannes, a colleague on this project. Um, I've s kind of been involved with and studied emerging and digital media since the beginning of my career. And so I'm very much always trying to figure out kind of what's new and interesting and how can it um, help people? How does it influence people? Um, and so I started becoming really interested in the voice assistants because as someone who spent a lot of their career thinking about screens and digital media and how do we get people to engage with digital media and how do we help um, people connect with each other through digital media and the removal of the screen and just being able to use your voice to do a lot of the things that we've done through screens um, was really interesting to me. So I, I did one of the first studies about um, kind of opportunities and affordances about um, voice assistance and found that you know there are some key opportunities that it provided right so um, just easy access. You don't have to learn anything special. There's no special interface. Yeah, so that's kind of a cool part about this because yeah. I think a lot of people think, oh, research, and you hear the word artificial intelligence, and you just sort of get freaked out. But this is pretty yeah. simple, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's really simple. The only thing you have to, you kind of have to learn the words to use to start interacting with the device. Um, and other than that, it's really about your natural voice. So that was a huge opportunity. Um, and then just the personalization and customization it can provide, it can really help. It can help provide you reminders to water the plants or feed the cats or practice piano if you're my nine-year-old daughter. She needs reminders pretty often <coughs> to practice piano as it happens. Um, and then just the ability to actually have a conversation and interact. And the conversation isn't perfect, but still it's, it's interactive and you get responses based on the feedback that you've provided. Um, and so that was pretty, a, a, a pretty big deal. And so I thought about um, who could benefit from uh, this type of technology. Um, and I started thinking about aging adults and people who are living by themselves and just being able to have easy access to entertainment and information and you know, reminders um, and companionship too. Um, so can it actually help influence someone's quality of life or their perceptions of loneliness and help them feel more connected to other people? Um, and. Uh, and fortunately, someone else thought it was a good idea and gave me a little bit of money to look into it. 
Correct, very cool. Okay, so let's talk about the research. Um, one of the things that uh, you always have to do on research is find some subjects, right? Yes. And we have to uh, sort of look at the, the different subjects and gather some information um, about them. So let's, let's sort of walk through at least a, a few things that, uh, that you're trying to discover in, in terms of your original questionnaire. Because again, when you're doing research, you have to find some initial information, then they go through the process, and then you take what you have discovered from that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about some mm -hmm. of the, uh, the things that you're trying to discover. And, and one of the big ones is about the technology. How much do people know about the technology? How much do they use it? Mm -hmm. And do they have a fear of it? Yeah. And so there's a kind of a whole sl slew of questions that we ask kind of at the beginning before you start interacting with the device and at the end. <coughs> um, and then we'll kind of compare those responses and also look at your interaction with the device, kind of look at the sorts of things that you've asked um, the Echo to do, um, and then start to get an understanding of the of how different types of folks um, interact with it and the benefits it can provide to different types of folks. So technology, for example, we want to get a sense before people start using um, the Echo of you know how comfortable are they with technology? How kind of savvy or competent do they feel? Are they kind of technophobic? Like are they kind of afraid of technology? How much of a role does it play in their lives from computers to smartphones to social media? Um, and we may and that helps influence what we may find at the end. Maybe people who are a little technophobic um, don't love using the device, or maybe they do because there's not a huge learning curve. Um, so those are kind of some of the questions that we're asking in the, in the beginning. Yeah, and sometimes um, you find people, I know lots of them, who are just scared of the technology. And, um, and, and this is one that uh, you don't have to be scared of it, right? No, no, it's really, it's really easy to use. You sort of have to learn the pattern, um, and then it's, it's pretty fun and intuitive to use. One of the other things that I, I think people get concerned about is the privacy issue, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you're trying to discover a little bit about that as well. Yeah. Um, in folks, I'm doing some other research um, on um, AI-powered voice assistants, and it seems like people kind of fall into two camps. Most of the people I'm talking to who have um, an Amazon Echo or something like it kind of assume that you know, there's this feeling that if somebody wants to listen to what I'm saying all day, every day, then they can do that already, so I don't care, and my life is not that interesting, so I don't care if someone's listening. Um, or they just kind of assume that, again, their life isn't that interesting, and they don't care if people are listening. Um, with this, definitely understand that there are um, some privacy concerns. We've kind of gotten over those in a lot of ways with our phones, and so I think it may be a question of it's it's new and it feels weird to know that maybe listening all the time. I don't know if you've ever had the situation where you've gotten an ad on your phone and it seems like it was related to a conversation you just had. Right. So we already have um, devices that are kind of on all of the time. But we do need to understand if people have concerns about privacy and if those are kind of influenced by interacting um, with the Echo um, or if maybe they're, they're heightened by their experiences. We'll find out. Okay, so we have a few minutes left. Here is our uh, other guest. Um, this is Alexa. <laughs> Hello, Alexa. Um, we're going to uh, try to go through uh, a few things that Alexa can do. That, that again, if you are somebody who is perhaps hmm, uh, spending... I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that really wasn't much of a question, was it? But what are some of the things that you... Let's just, let's just start with some real simple things about... Uh, what uh, people might do. Yeah, so we know that the, the most common uses are things like, Alexa, what's the weather in Lincoln, Nebraska? In Lincoln, Nebraska, it's 76 degrees Fahrenheit with partly sunny skies. Today, you can look for intermittent clouds with a high of 88 degrees and a low of 67 degrees. There we go. Okay. And that's a really common use, or um, setting timers. Um, uh, if you're cooking in the kitchen, for example, we do this pretty often. Or if your kids are in timeout, <coughs> I do this pretty often. Um, and then just getting other types of information like um, sports, for example. I don't know if you follow golf at all. I do. You know? um, but Alexa, give me an update on the PGA Championship. The 2019 PGA Championship is underway. Brooks Kepka is in first place at seven under par. Dustin Johnson is in second place at four under par. 
Tommy Fleetwood and Daniel Berger are tied for third place at three under par. Yeah, who knew? Very good. Okay. One of the really cool things about this is the ability to uh, provide some things that will really be helpful for the mm -hmm. person. So you could provide some reminders of people to perhaps um, take uh, medications or it could be setting up a to-do list or it could be any number of helpful things like that. Yeah, absolutely. You could create a to-do list right now and then ask Alexa what's on your to-do list. Your to-do list is empty. Right, we're not very good at this. But. <laughs> um, and the reminders can be really powerful. You can be set, it can, they can be set to remind you every day at a certain time, you know, every day at 7 a.m., take this pill, or every day at 8 p.m., water these plants, or on Thursday, call Jerry and tell him happy birthday. <coughs> um, so it can be a useful, really, um, way to just keep track of and manage your life for any age. You are hopefully going to work uh, with uh, somebody in town to try to provide um, some of these devices for people and, 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 and let them put them through the paces. Yeah, we have an independent living facility that we're uh, partnering with. And they have residents who are already kind of excited about um, using these devices. Um, one of the things that... And here's a, we have up on the screen, just if somebody is interested in this, uh, this is how they can get a hold of you. Uh, you're happy to chat with them about it, right? I would love to. Very good. We are out of time. Uh, I hope you will come back and once you have completed your research and, and let us know what you found. It would be a pleasure. Thank Thanks you. so much for having me. Thank you for being here. We appreciate that. And thank all of you for tuning in today. We very much appreciate that. I've been your host, Jerry Renault. Thank you so much. And always remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Legal services are a part of the spectrum of senior services available through our eight area agencies on aging. Attorneys can assist and educate seniors on consumer credit and debt collection issues, as well as help them plan ahead with advanced directives. Attorneys can also help seniors with consumer fraud and financial exploitation concerns, and also guide them through government benefit issues. For more information, contact the Elder Access Line at 800-527-7249. Welcome to Live and Learn. Is that favorite bowl you have a real antique? With me today is Tom Bassett. Welcome, Tom, and we're going to visit about uh, antiques. Uh, good to be with you. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Before we get into antiques, Tom, uh, let's talk about uh, Tom Bassett, the athlete. Uh, oh, yes. You're well known uh, around these parts for your running. Uh, are you still running? Nebraska Wesleyan grad, uh, ran rather well at Nebraska Wesleyan and uh, set a few school records. You and, even uh, had an All-American designation. Yep, yep. First All-American at Wesleyan, that's a great honor. And then I went on to keep running in open meets, master's meets, senior meets until I was 65, which is a few years ago, and then ran into some health problems. So I had to quit running, but uh, I would encourage people, to, uh, if they can't get out and run competitively, certainly... Uh, Keep doing some biking, some walking, some treadmill exercises, and, and keep going. So that's that's what you would recommend if the legs, the legs aren't there or whatever. Is. Just keep that heart going and legs uh, keep a, a little bit of muscle tone. Let's get into the antique side. Uh, how did you get involved with uh, antiques and appraisals? I think some people, Doug, are just collectors. They're born collectors. And, and by the time I was seven or eight, I was collecting ball cards and rocks and stamps and marbles. And, uh, and then coins became a serious hobby of mine at about age 13. And then my sister married into a family in Hastings, which is my hometown, and they had the finest antique collection around. And, uh, and my sister's mother-in-law took me under her wing and started to teach me about uh, uh, some of the scarcity of, of glassware and china and antique rugs and furnishings. And uh, she became my mentor. And, uh, and it just opened my eyes to a new type of collection and then uh, once my wife and I got married, uh, my mentor said, well, don't go out and buy new furniture. Go to auctions, uh, <laughs> find some nice old oak or walnut furniture and buy that. It'll be cheaper and it'll last a long time and you'll sell it for money. She was right. And boy, I was hooked from about age 22 on that uh, collecting antiques and valuing antiques is a great hobby. Let's get into the, the trends a little bit. Uh, the yeah. value of some antiques go up and down. Yes, they do. What, what's the current uh, trend in terms of what's, what's popular and what's not so popular? Yeah. 
I, I think people a lot of times these days consider decorating a room or several rooms with antiques could be in the kitchen and then you have crockery bowls and jars and jugs and uh, wooden bowls and wooden spatulas and so forth. Uh, things that remind them maybe of something grandma had or great grandma had right. that you saw. Uh, the old wall match holders uh, uh, that you kept above the cook stove or maybe you had a kitchen clock that uh, grandma had. And those things bring back memories and they're still nice decorative pieces. So those things have pretty much held their values. Now a lot of nice glassware from the late 1800s and early 1900s uh, if you have a lot of it, uh, you should have sold it 20 years ago <laughs> because it's not doing as well these days. We're just running short of collectors of china and glassware. Uh, for men, on the men's side of uh, collecting, it seems like uh, old golf clubs and uh, golf-related items, whether oh, they're trophies, medals, scorecards, uh, old golf tees, old golf balls, uh, very popular. Anything fishing-related, hunting-related, whether it's prints, posters, advertising, uh, they're, keep, they're doing quite well. It's Christmas uh, time coming up here, and that's mm -hmm. the time maybe people look in their cabinets yes. and look at some of the uh, yeah, things that they think might have value, and yeah. you brought some along with us. Let's, let's have a, look. Have let's a little have show a... and tell today. You bet. I had to borrow some from my wife, so I have to be very careful here. But from about 1940s, we have a little plastic uh, uh, reindeer pulling a little paper mache uh, sled, and uh, Santa's got a couple gifts back there. He's plastic, but this from about 1940s and very fragile little thing, but quite popular. Uh, and then also unpopular, we have uh, some nice pins over here, and you can't, you can't have too many nice Christmas pins, uh, that, says my wife. That's right, yeah. And various companies here, this is Eisenberg uh, Company, probably from the 1950s, uh, very nice, uh, very valuable pin. This is Weiss, W-E-I-S-S, -S, designer, quite a nice pin. <laughs> this is Hollycraft, probably more from about the 1970s or 80s. But you can't have too many of those. And then we have uh, some postcards. And I, I tell you, postcards are still very collectible, particularly the ones pre-1920. These are all about 1910 era. Uh, can't have too many cats uh, or dogs on, on a postcard. <laughs> so we have Christmas wishes and two cats playing in a band. And we have our little touch, Dutch gal here wishing you a Merry Christmas. Then a more traditional Santa dressed in red. And he's got a toy in one arm and a doll in the other. And he's putting things in the stocking. And then here's the unusual one. It's Santa dressed in green. Okay. And, and about nine out of 10 Christmas cards that depict Santa, he's always in red. So I, I've got one that's blue and one that's green and one that's black and one that's brown. And those are worth about three times as much as the ones that are in red. Is that more European? Yes, a lot of those made in Germany. Germany right. did a lot of the printing of postcards uh, prior to World War I. So what, what if, if they're blank or, or written, does that make a difference? Great a question, not too much. Uh, it just doesn't make a lot of difference. Now it's nice on the back if it does have a postmark that says like this one does, 1908. So okay. you, can, you can date it, uh, but not too much. Now if someone writes on the front, that's not good. <laughs> but if they write on the back, that's not bad. And that, I brought this plate. That's yeah, that, that plate uh, would bring back memories to a lot of people, I'm sure, because it seems like a lot of moms, dads, aunts, and uncles had these displayed in their in their kitchen. A lot of times up on the wall, and uh, they're Danish Christmas plates. Two companies kind of dominated the marketplace. One was Bing and Grondel or B and G plates, and this is the other competition. This is uh, Royal Copenhagen, and between the two, they sent millions of these things to American buyers in the 1960s, 70s, and into the 80s. And then for whatever reason, the, uh, the rats jumped off the ship or uh, people just stopped collecting them uh, in any great numbers. And so nowadays we've got too much of a supply, not enough of a demand, and a lot of these for, are for sale at, at estate sales, tag sales, garage sales, auctions, and uh, they're like two and three and four dollars now, and they used to be 30. Now you've, you've worked with families and, and, and appraisal and so on. Um, do you have guidelines for sort of how they disperse those, those antiques or what are the issues that you get into with families? I think uh, it, it, it needs some good conversation among family members and, and, uh, and mom, dad, whomever the, the elder is, uh, regarding what, what, would, what would kids really want? And it's a good time when you get together at, at Christmas or an anniversary or a reunion of some kind and give everybody a little slip of paper or a big slip of paper <laughs> and on there let okay. them write down some things they would like they, they want uh, uh, they want grandma's set of china or they want uh, grandma's mixing bowl or they want grandpa's rocking chair whatever it is they want 
and then uh, lucky some family member, uh, mom, dad, or whomever, gets to compare the lists and see if there's any things that two or three people want. And then the guidelines become, okay, you're the oldest, you get first pick. Or I like you best. Well, you wouldn't say that probably. It's not a good thing, maybe. But uh, certainly there needs to be some conversation before you find out that someone's got, you know, a limited amount of time left in life and now we can't get all the family together. And so it really becomes a, a, a big conversation, but an important one. And more and more now that I hear from uh, people that I deal with who are in their 70s, 80s, 90s, they find out that a lot of times their kids don't want much of anything. They yeah, like new, they don't like old, and that's okay because then you can divide things up as you see fit and nobody's going to be too mad at you. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because it seems like that that's happening. You know, yeah. people yeah. end up with a lot that, that families mm -hmm. don't need and, yeah. or don't want. And, yeah. and uh, so then it's back to the real collectors that, that mm -hmm. maybe put value on things. I exactly, yes. Um, uh, and I do a lot of work for, for families, for banks, for law firms, uh, just putting prices on things so that family can divide things up fairly. Now maybe, maybe your oldest child doesn't like that vase, but it is worth a hundred bucks and they should know that <laughs> if you leave it to them. And those bowls over there, they're worth $200 and that family member ought to know that. And so uh, it's sometimes become an, an equality, uh, financial equality uh, uh, act that, that uh, a family can do for the kids and the grandkids to at least divide things up in a way that shows values and, uh, and fairness. And then if the family member doesn't want it, they can sell it. $100 bills are easy to divide up. <laughs> Talking about selling things, now mm -hmm. there's two approaches to that. You yes. know, the auctions have been around for a long oh, time. Oh my, yes. And state sales uh, seem to be coming, becoming more popular. What are, from, from your point of view yeah, as an appraiser yeah. and an auctioneer, yeah. <laughs> what are the pros and cons? I have biases on both sides because <laughs> I was an auctioneer for 10 years, but I've been helping with estate sales for about the last 10 years, and now my daughter's in the estate sale business, so I've seen both sides. Auctions in Nebraska have been very popular for a number of years. However, weather does play a part in auctions sometimes, and I'd rather <coughs> see some of my things in uh, in the house with a price tag on it than he would out on the front lawn hoping that people show up and bid on my whatever it is. And so that's a little pro and con there from, from the weather standpoint. But I really encourage people to, to do their homework. Go to an auction. See how it works. So we have several good auction firms here in, the, in Lincoln. They advertise usually in Sunday's paper. They have websites. You can find out when their next auction is that has personal property. Go to it, see how, how good or bad they do in prices and how many people attend. And the same thing with estate sales. We've got three or four very reputable uh, estate sale groups here in town, and you can find them on the internet. And, uh, and go to one or two of their sales. Go towards the start of a sale to see how many things were there at that first three or four hours then go to the last two hours and see how many things are left. Oh, okay, that's, yeah. that's interesting. <laughs> and see what's left because some people think, well, certainly if somebody will buy that dining room table and eight chairs, well, not necessarily. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it depends on who comes that day. And That's so, right. And At so an auction, you need two people to push the values up to where you get a, a good price, shall we say. On a tag sale, you need one. And because you, all you do is put $150 on that, uh, on that cedar chest, right person comes up, spends the money. Tom, and just sort of summarizing here, um, what, what is your most uh, good feeling in terms of working with families to make all these decisions? Very good question. I think I bring peace of mind to families. Uh, they're oftentimes worried that they will give a family member something and, um, and it will be uh, something that other family members will say, gee, my brother got the $500 vase and I got the $20 vase. But if I tell them that that $500 vase really isn't 500, it's 75 bucks, then they don't feel so bad that uh, they, they've divided things up and, and tried to be fair uh, in, in a financial uh, equality range. So that back to your, your proposal there, sort of take turns, uh, 
selecting things, and that, and that is a way to sort of get around some of that animosity that might occur? It, it sure can be, but you have to do some planning ahead uh, of when you're going to move to smaller quarters and downsize. So now we have to sell or give away half of what we own. We're moving from 3,000 square feet to 1,200 square feet. <laughs> now we have to give away or, or see to it that we're, we're short a couple thousand square feet of things. And so to get a value on some of those things uh, becomes important in a fairness issue. Yeah, it's uh, very fulfilling, I presume, to you. It, it really is because I, I oftentimes hear people say, well, my neighbor said this such and such. Uh, she saw something on uh, uh, an antique roadshow, just just like it. Yes. And it's $2,000. And I say, no, the one you have. she saw for 2000 was made in Russia. Yours was made in Japan. And it's worth about 100 bucks. Tom, this has been very uh, informative and, and informational. Thanks a lot. It's, uh, You're very welcome. Very, very interesting. Welcome. Tom's contact information is on the screen. Remember, it's never too late to live and learn about the antiques that you have in your cupboards. I'm Sharon Cheney with Aging Partners here in Lincoln and uh, wanted to talk just a little bit about winter walking and getting out in the winter, still continuing your exercise program, but without the fear of falling. Okay, so we've got a few props. We'll show you a couple of things. We have this cane with the attachment that just snaps off like that. And then they put this right there when you're not using them. Just, it just folds right back up like that. And so that's a nice addition to your cane for safety. If you're going out and you think it might be slick, have this in your car. It's just a bottle with a fairly large opening that you can keep sand or ice melt or something in it. So when you get out, you can kind of sprinkle it around till you get the feel of the ground beneath your feet. Have you ever stepped out of your car and there, whoops, and then there you are sitting on your rear end. So that might pay, help you with that. We've also got shoe grippers on the bottom. Yaks Tracks is, I'm not promoting anything. This was just a brand that will fit over your shoe. And then leave these shoes right by the doorway could be, because they can be slick in your house on wood floors. Also, you may want to think about how we walk. You know, some of us, we just walk real stiff and everything. Have you ever noticed penguins walk? They're always so fun. They always kind of like, they walk like this with their, you know, their legs out like that, and then they just kind of waddle. But when we think of humans, we need to keep our knees a little soft and just walk slow enough, give yourself a wider base, and there you are. Some other options, we were talking about mall walking. Gateway is a wonderful place to walk because it's all indoors. Be careful coming in and out because as you step off some of those rugs, be sure that it's not uh, slippery there. But you can also come, Aging Partners has a wellness facility, has uh, exercise bikes, has treadmills, all sorts of, of activities that you can partake in. And uh, also just think of a big grocery store. You can walk in a big grocery store if, you, if you're out there buying uh, things for your home, may as well just walk a few extra laps and then, then you're done. If you have your druthers and you don't have to be out, and you, there's no place you really need to get to, just hold on till the streets are cleaned a little bit more. Just kind of, you know, kick back, walk through your own house. If you've got stairs, you can walk up and down them, you can walk around. And, and like I say, you might feel like you're kind of funny, but it does get you out of that chair and get you moving again right in your own home. What we want you to do is stay safe and stay happy during this holiday season and all through the winter. Just stay safe.